ZBrush has finally landed on the iPad and it is a game changer, but is it a true mobile sculpting powerhouse or is it just a watered down version of ZBrush? What about that infamous ZBrush UI? Has it finally gotten its well-deserved makeover? Stick around as we dive deep into ZBrush for iPad and answer all those burning questions. By the way, if you wanna download that little Kappa sculpt character that I made for this video, you can download that project file for free, you'll find that link in the description below. ZBrush has been the bread and butter of the 3D industry for years. It's been used for everything from crafting video game characters to bringing blockbuster movie monsters to life. Now Maxon is squeezing all that power into your iPad, making 3D sculpting more mobile than ever. They've literally created a one-to-one -one version of the desktop app for the iPad allowing you to move seamlessly between desktop and iPad versions using their Gozi export feature. Now you can download ZBrush for iPad from the App Store and once you open it up, you'll be greeted by this lovely little splash screen where you can start a new sculpt, choose whatever base mesh that you want or even open up a ZBrush file. Now I'm gonna go ahead and click on the DynaMesh Sphere to start and you'll get launched into this sculpting UI. Now if you're a ZBrush user, you'll notice that this interface is both familiar and different, like a pineapple with pizza on it. You might wonder, is this the best decision ever, or did I just ruin a perfectly good pizza? The UI has undergone a complete transformation from the uh, ZBrush desktop workspaces, 1970s spaceship control deck aesthetic, and is now much cleaner and streamlined. Gone is the visual clutter of menus all over the place, the new interface is optimized for touch and the Apple Pencil, making for a pretty smooth iPad experience. Now, if you're familiar with the desktop version, you're gonna feel right at home. Many of the main toolbars and menus are in similar locations to where they are on the desktop version. The UI smartly leverages iPad functionality, long press reveals more tool options, while three finger gestures control brush size and focal shift. And if you have the latest iPad and Apple Pencil, you'll be able to take advantage of the new features like barrel roll, squeeze, and hover state, which gives you a live brush size preview. Plus, ZBrush for iPad, like its desktop sibling, offers loads of customization options, so you can kind of bend ZBrush to your will. Now, if you're a ZBrush user, you know that it has more shortcut keys than TikTok has cringy dance videos. And to help with that, they've added a nice little navigation ring that offers quick access to essential functions like smoothing, Z sub, Z add, masking, and the fully customizable quick menu. While the ring's icons are pretty clear, I feel like other menu icons could use improvement. The wireframe and ghosting icons, for example, aren't immediately intuitive. The same goes for the brush toolbar at the bottom. Unless you're a ZBrush Pro, you'd be hard pressed to identify any of these brushes. Adding descriptors above these icons or adding a little hover state to display tool names would be a huge improvement here. In this bottom menu, you'll find the navigation gizmo and it works exactly like it does on the desktop with long press bringing up the ability to turn on the transpose line. And if you click on the gear icon, you can access all your familiar deformation tools. While the UI is a significant upgrade from the desktop version, like it is a lot nicer, it still kind of feels unintuitive with a lot of features and tools being buried in menus. I often find myself lost when searching for certain functions with some requiring multiple clicks and extensive scrolling. Take mirroring, for example, a common function in both ZBrush for iPad and desktop. It is a five click process. If you click on the palette, you gotta find the tool menu, click on geometry, scroll to the modified topology menu, twirl that down, then click mirror and weld. In other apps, you can just do this in two clicks. Other options I frequently use, like polish and inflate, aren't easily accessible either. And these menus are kind of large and kind of tend to take up a lot of screen real estate. That said, like the desktop version, ZBrush for iPad allows UI customization. You can add commands to the quick menu, customize the bottom menu bar, and favorite brushes. But with all the empty space in the interface, I feel it still has room for improvement on the intuitiveness side and can provide better usability for beginners especially. Power users, on the other hand, will really appreciate the added keyboard support so they can use all their ZBrush shortcuts while on the go. Now, before we dive deeper into ZBrush for iPad, if you're new to 3D modeling and want to build a solid foundation, check out 
our Intro to Cinema 4D course, Cinema 4D Basecamp. It's gonna be perfect for any 3D beginners and will give you the skills you need to add 3D to your tool set. You'll find the link in the description below. So let's dive into these features, shall we? As I mentioned earlier, ZBrush for iPad aims to be like a mirror image of the desktop app. In this first version, it's pretty impressive how they've managed to pack a substantial portion of the desktop app's power into the iPad. You'll find most of your familiar desktop brushes are here with powerhouse tools like Z Remesher, Sculptress Pro, and Dynamic Brushes. It's worth noting that performance can vary depending on your iPad model. I'm using an iPad Pro from a couple years ago and it handles most tasks and high resolution sculpts pretty smoothly. However, if you're rocking an older iPad, you might find your sculpting experiences a little bit choppier than trying to watch a YouTube video using airplane Wi-Fi. All right, so let's do a little demo here. I'm going to attempt to create a little character head to show you some of the tools in action. No promises, this won't just end up looking like a potato with eyes though. We're gonna go and we're gonna do a new sculpt. Let's get our Dynamesh sphere here. And we are going to be able to zoom in, zoom out. We got the move brush here selected. I'm gonna three finger gesture up or down to increase the size. Or if I three finger gesture to the right or left, you're gonna see that will change the focus distance. You can see those little options here. And then for Z add, that's the strength basically. And then your RGB, there's your materials, your brushes and the stroke. So similar areas that they are on the desktop, okay? So we're gonna make this brush fairly big and let's make sure symmetry's on, which is this button right here. So if I long press, these are the symmetry options. You can choose whether you want radial or X, Y, or Z. This is much easier to access than the desktop version. So that's a nice improvement there. And then if I want to just start sculpting, I can go just like this and Let's make a happy little potato. And what we can do is if I wanna to snap to the front, one thing that is nice is I can just click on that once it's gonna to snap to that front view. And so I can start adjusting this. And then to get my smooth, I need to just go and just click and hold on the smooth icon there, it's right there. And that will get my smooth brush. You can see all the different smooth brushes down here. So very handy, all the lift different little tools here. So I can make this smaller, I can go and if I wanna make a little mask, I can invert that by clicking and tapping on the canvas and then get my gizmo right here and just kind of move everything back, get my little eye holes there. And then to release the mask, I'm gonna click and hold on that mask and then click and drag. So very similar to the workflow on desktop. And we can go and smooth this out. Let's get a brush first, smooth that out. And then let's append by going to our sub tools menu here and we can get some, say some eyeballs. So we'll get my sphere tool. Let's get our gizmo and let's move this to the side, let's shrink this down. And then just like I said, where it's a little bit difficult to navigate to the mirror. So instead of going through all the menus, what I did was just created a specific quick menu where you can drag and drop different features and different tools from different palettes and just add them to your own custom quick menu. So I did that, I added mirror and weld, polish and flate and flate balloon and then subdivision because that's something that I always use all the time. So I want that quick access. So I don't have to dig into all these different menus and stuff like that. So let me go and I'm gonna get my quick menu here. So here's my quick menu, I'm gonna click and hold and I can use these arrows to snap this to the side, either side there. And I'm just gonna swipe over Here's my polish if I want that. But then if I want mirror and weld, I'm gonna go get mirror and weld. And now I got symmetry on, so I can go and start adjusting this. And pretty nice. So there is my potato eyeballs. And we can go and let's color this, fill object with the white. And let's actually go and we can show choose a different material here. So we're using matte cap, so let's just do do, do, do. Let's do soft plastic, it's fun. And so we'll go and fill object and then we can go and get our paint brush. Let's change the color there. 
and we can make this a little smaller. I've got that, and then we can hold this button right here and then tap, and that will select the different sub tools. So you can go over here and you can see which sub tool is selected. If I get the I or not. So we'll change this to nice potato-y color. This is gonna look so amazing. Fill object, and then let's get our damn standard and and we'll go and we'll just make a little smiley face. And there's the most amazing sculpt I have ever done in my life. But you can see that all of the menus, everything is pretty similar to where they are. Instead of the massive menu at the top, you can also access it from this menu here. Go to the tools and you have basically everything you need. There's all the geometry, all that stuff that used to be all the little menus that were on the side on the desktop. Everything is right here. So if you're used to working on the desktop, you will feel right at home, all the different menus. A lot of things are very easy to do, like subdivide. There's dedicated buttons that if you long press, you can do Z Remesher, Sculptures Pro, Dynamesh. So nice dedicated buttons down here. Long pressing can do a lot of different things in the UI. So we get the line fill. There's your ghosting, solo, and we can subdivide this so this is a much nicer, smooth potato face person looking good. As you can see, sculpting on the iPad is intuitive for pretty much anyone that is familiar with the desktop version. And I would argue this version of ZBrush is much easier to pick up because it really doesn't rely on you memorizing a, a, a plethora of, of shortcut keys. Plethora, that's a good $10 word for you. And the touch controls for rotating, panning, and zooming feel uh, as natural as doom scrolling through Twitter. Being able to sculpt on a screen with a stylus was a game changer for me when learning 3D sculpting. It's a much more natural experience than trying to sculpt with say a mouse or a tablet. So if you have been eyeing ZBrush but dry heaved at the price of a display tablet or felt intimidated by the desktop version, this version will have you grab your Apple Pencil and start sculpting faster than you can say, is that supposed to be a face? Now, one of the great things about ZBrush for iPad is how nicely it plays with ZBrush for desktop and Cinema 4D. You can easily export or import your models in various formats, and by using GoZ, you can easily jump from working on the iPad to the desktop version and vice versa with just a couple clicks. This means you could start a concept on your iPad while pretending to pay attention in a meeting and finish it later on your desktop. Now let's talk about versions. ZBrush for iPad comes in two flavors, the free version and the full version. The free version offers enough to start learning ZBrush with you know, some core sculpting tools and some brushes. However, you're gonna miss out on that essential clay buildup brush. And the biggest drawback is you can't export your creations, which is a major limitation that might deter potential users. The full version, which is available through subscription, unlocks all the sculpting brushes and the ability to save and export files. The great thing is, is if you already have a Max on One subscription, you get ZBrush for iPad included, so you can start ZBrushing right away. Now, for those of you without a Max on One subscription, you can still get ZBrush for iPad individually for $89.99 a year or $9.99 a month. So what is the verdict here? On one hand, the mobility is fantastic. Being able to sculpt from anywhere is a game changer for many artists. And if you've been holding off on learning ZBrush because of how intimidating that, uh, that bulky desktop app is, this is a great little uh, gateway drug to the full Z experience. The interface is well adapted for touch in the Apple Pencil. The core ZBrush experience is largely intact. On the downside, the core ZBrush experience is largely intact. ZBrush is infamous for its cluttered UI and steep learning curve. I can't help but feel like ZBrush may have missed an opportunity to streamline its notorious complex user experience. While still preserving familiar workflows for its existing users, it could have offered a more intuitive experience for newcomers without all the bells and whistles. 
Doing what are seemingly simple things like selecting multiple meshes is still as laborious as it is on the desktop. A reimagined iPad optimized interface focusing on core sculpting tools and a simplified workflow would have made the app more accessible without sacrificing the power it has. Consider apps like Illustrator for iPad or Adobe Fresco. These are basically streamlined versions of desktop software optimized for the iPad. These apps prioritize core features in iPad specific workflows. And as an Illustrator for iPad user, I've seen how it adapts desktop features for mobile, like pencil tool smoothing and non-destructive Pathfinder, which are unique to the iPad version. Adobe focused on these essential tools and workflows, leaving out desktop features that didn't make much sense for iPad use. Now, as a ZBrush noob, I initially found the iPad version super challenging, feeling a bit lost. The interface wasn't as intuitive to me as, say, a Nomad Sculpt was, with its helpful icon labels and easy to navigate UI. However, after learning the desktop version of ZBrush, I can say that I now grasp the iPad version better and understand the uh, method to the madness, you could say. For newcomers to ZBrush, the learning curve for the iPad version is slightly less steep than the desktop version and using it can at times feel like you're learning a new language and an app at the same time. I mean, their brush names still kind of get to me. I'll be thinking to myself, you know, what is that name for the crease brush again? And I'm like desperately fumbling through menus and it's like, oh, the damn standard brush. Damn it to hell. So this is where ZBrush for iPad becomes a bit of a conundrum for me. It'll be like Christmas for ZBrush power users and anyone who currently has a Max on One subscription and has been wanting to learn ZBrush, just like myself. But for those outside of the Maxon ecosystem or anyone currently using Nomad Sculpt, I feel like the steep price and the learning curve will make it a hard sell unless you absolutely need its advanced features. And with that, we have reached the end of our ZBrush for iPad journey. While it may not revolutionize sculpting for beginners, I feel like it's an absolute game changer for ZBrush enthusiasts and anyone who has been waiting for the iPad version to jump on the ZBrush train. It offers a portable studio that while not quite a desktop replacement just yet, is a powerful sidekick nonetheless. And this is version one, of course. There's room for improvement, especially in iPad-specific workflows. It currently sometimes feels like it's a desktop app parading around in iPad clothing, but I feel it's gonna be evolving towards a more mobile-friendly design soon. So what say you? Have you tried ZBrush for iPad yet? Be sure to share your thoughts. And if you haven't tried ZBrush for iPad yet, definitely give the free version a go. You might just create your own amazing smiling potato from the comfort of your very own couch. That'll be it for now. If this video has helped you, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up to date on all the latest 3D and motion design happenings. And remember, in 3D sculpting, there are no mistakes, only happy little polygons. I'll see you in the next video.